The Buddha tells of how, when he was young, and it finally hit him really hard that he wasn't going to be young forever. He was going to grow old, go sick, ultimately die. And here he was looking for happiness and things that would also grow old, get sick, and die. And he decided the only thing that was really worthwhile to take as a goal was something that would not grow old, get sick, or die. Something that was deathless. So he went out in search. And he characterized his search as the search for what is skillful. It's an interesting connection. That to find the deathless, you'd have to find something skillful. He's assuming several things. One is that if the deathless is to be found, it's going to be found through human action. It doesn't just come floating by. Awakening is not a spiritual accident. It comes from your actions. And the idea of a skill implies that there are patterns to the actions. Certain actions lead to good results, other actions lead to bad results. There's enough of, enough of a pattern that things make sense, but not so much of a pattern that everything is determined. There is some freedom of choice. And all those are the basic assumptions that lead to wisdom and discernment. And the factors for awakening, the, the discernment faculty, called analysis of dhammas, which can mean either analysis of qualities or analysis of actions. It's fostered, the Buddha said, by paying careful attention to what's skillful and what's not skillful, what sides with the dark side of the mind, what sides with the bright side of the mind. So again, there's an assumption that the mind here is the cause of the actions. You do have choice. And there are going to be some actions that lead to good results and others that don't lead to good results. And if you pay appropriate attention to that issue, you'll be able to see for yourself. Because that's a lot of what discernment is, is looking for yourself, not just simply believing what you're told. You take certain things as working hypotheses. Then you put them to the test. When the Buddha was talking to the Galamas, that's what he's basically saying. You don't go just by scriptures or out of respect for your teacher. You also don't go by your own sense of reason or what you like or what seems to make sense given your current worldview. You have to look at what actually happens when you act on certain teachings, certain principles. If you see that they're unskillful, you abandon them. If they're not, if they're skillful, you develop them. Now, some people say that this teaching for the Galamas was meant only for people who are not really Buddhist, who haven't committed themselves to the path. And in one sense, they're right, because the Buddha says, once you've committed yourself, you keep reminding yourself, okay, the Buddha knows. I don't know yet, but the Buddha does. But that doesn't mean that you accept things blindly. You still have to test them, because discernment is a matter of seeing things for yourself. You get some advice from others. One of the ways of augmenting your discernment is to ask those who know what is skillful and what's not, what leads to long-term welfare and happiness, what leads to long-term suffering and pain, which is a good working definition for skillful and unskillful. But you've got to look. You get ideas from other people, then you've got to test them. As the Buddha said, he points out the way, but it's up to you to not just obey him, but to take his teachings and see if they really work. This is a principle that's really strong in the forest tradition. John Mahabha at one point said, try to prove the Buddha wrong. In other words, you have conviction in the Buddha, but still you've got to test it. Is this conviction well-founded?
so you pay appropriate attention. In other words, you look at what you do when you try to follow the path, and you gauge the results. And if something is working, you keep, keep that in mind. If it's not working, you keep that in mind as well. You have to depend on your powers of observation. And John Lee, when he talks about this factor of awakening, analysis of dhammas, equates it with directed thought and evaluation. That's one of the ways in which it manifests itself as you're doing concentration practice. Because these factors for awakening start with start with mindfulness and then with concentration. They basically show you how you use your discernment when you start out being mindful to get it into concentration. The frame is basically learning to adjust the mind and the object of the mind so they fit snugly together. So it's a good place to stay. You're working with the breath. Can you evaluate the breath? What ways of breathing are good? What ways of perceiving or conceiving the breath are helpful? And if you're not sure, well, you try them out. Because there's nobody going to tell you, okay, a breath this long is going to be good for you, or a breath that long. Or fast breathing or slow breathing, whatever. Some people will try to tell you you have to focus around the mouth. That's based on a translation of a term, Pari Mukang, which is used in a lot of the Buddhist descriptions of breath meditation. But it's also used in his descriptions of other kinds of meditation that have nothing to do with the breath at all. In fact, Goodwill meditation is also Bari Mukang. But it seems to me is that you bring the topic of the meditation to the fore. You make that the most interesting thing that you have in your range of awareness. You don't let other things come in and take over. So you can focus anywhere you want. You can focus on your little toe if you like. You can focus in your bones. And John Lee gives you some ideas for good resting spots of the breath, he calls them, the areas from which the breath energy seems to emanate as you breathe in. But those are just the beginning. And you look at his own Dhamma talks after he wrote Method 2. He has lots of different ways of dealing with the breath. Sometimes they go against the ways he recommends in Method 2. Instead of having the breath go down, he has it go up. He talks about different levels of breath energy in the body. You can investigate those. There's the in and out breath, and then there's what he calls the refined breath, which are the waves of energy that go through the blood vessels, go through the nerves. And then there's the profound breath, which is still. We've got all these levels of breath going in the body at any one time. It's simply a matter of which one you're going to tune into, and which one is good for your mind right now. That's what appropriate attention means, is you check out these various things. And this is how you develop your own discernment. It's a development of your own sensitivity. I was reading recently someone saying that the word banya in Pali, which I translate as discernment, really doesn't mean just discernment. It means profound understanding of the three characteristics. But the word banya is related to a verb, bachanati. That can relate to anything, profound or unprofound, where you use your, dis your discernment to distinguish what's happening and what's also good about what's happening, or what's wrong with what's happening. Even noticing that your breath is short or long, that's bachanati. You notice when a certain mind state is present, you notice when it's absent, that's also bachanati. But more importantly, you're going to see connections. Discernment sees distinctions, but it also sees connections between these things that you've distinguished out. As Buddha said, it's when you see things as separate, that's when you understand them. Separate by interacting, and particularly separate from your awareness. Your breath is one thing, your awareness is something else. This is where the 
factor of analysis of dhammas goes beyond just directed thought and evaluation in the first jhana. It's when you start evaluating your concentration as you go from one level to the next. Now, whether you're leaving that jhana to do a little first jhana work before you go into the next jhana, or how you would divide it up. Then the important thing is that you're checking to see how is the meditation going? Where is it still? Where is it not still? Where is the disturbance right now? You want to wait until the mind has been thoroughly settled in before you do this. That's something else you have to engage. Is when are you ready for this? Asking of questions. Sometimes it's all you can do just to get the mind to settle down and stay there. Which, if that's all you can handle right now, that's what you should do. But there will come a point where you can ask, is this as still as the mind can be, or could it, could it be even more still? And what's preventing it from settling down? You can get some ideas from the Buddha's map of the different levels of concentration. But you've got to see these things in action. Again, this is where the real discernment comes in, the real sensitivity. And you see it as you get the mind still, but there's an unevenness to the stillness. There's a level of subtle stress that goes up and down. You want to catch it when it goes up. What do you do when it goes up? What did you do when it goes down? What was the perception that made it go up? When the perception dropped, did it go down? Maybe they're connected. Check it out. There's lots to gauge. The perception, the point where you're focused, the quality of the breath, the range of your awareness, the place where you're focused. There's a lot to experiment with. And that's how you develop this factor. Because it connects with the next one, which is persistence, i.e. right effort. Once you know something is skillful, you try to develop it. If it's unskillful, you try to drop it. You're not learning these things simply to, as I say in Thai, decorate your mind. You're learning these distinctions so you can put them to use. Because after all, when the Buddha was searching for what is skillful, he didn't stop with knowing that something was skillful and unskillful, he put that knowledge to use. It was for the sake of the deathless. So you keep checking as the mind settles down. We're heading for something that doesn't change. So you want to look at the state of the mind that you develop as you get the mind concentrated and make it as unchanging as you can. And then you see there's subtle levels of change that you might not have noticed otherwise. This is how you explore. This is how you put that knowledge to use. This is the path that the Buddha followed in order to find the deathless. And the path hasn't changed. It's simply up to us to follow it as best we can, with as much sensitivity as we can. So that we can find the same results that he did. <laughs>